This is a GCSE biology revision video looking at how water and nitrogen levels are controlled within the body as part of homeostasis. This comes up in Unit 5 in Paper 2 of AQA GCSE Biology or Combined Science. We'll also look at the role of the kidney within these systems and how people with kidney disease can be treated using either dialysis or organ transplant. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain why it's important to maintain water balance within the body and describe how water is gained and lost. You need to know how to describe the process of selective reabsorption in the kidneys and what the role of antidiuretic hormone is within this. We'll look at the role of the kidney in maintaining nitrogen balance and then finally evaluate the use of dialysis and organ transplant to treat kidney disease. As part of homeostasis, water and ion content, body temperature and blood glucose levels all need to be kept within very narrow ranges. Maintaining the levels of water and mineral salts in the blood and tissue fluid is really important for keeping healthy cells. The red blood cells can be particularly susceptible to damage if excessive hydration or dehydration happens, but all cells will experience a loss in efficiency if proper water balance is not maintained. In an ideal world, the concentration of mineral ions inside the cells and around them should be the same, otherwise water will start to move by osmosis. You met osmosis as part of Unit 1, and you should know that this is the overall movement of water from a dilute solution where there's lots of water to a concentrated solution where there's less water across a partially permeable membrane, such as a cell membrane. In this diagram, you can see that the water is moving from the right to the left of the diagram, because even though there's about the same amount of water on both sides, there are far less solutes on the right. So the water moves from the right to the left in order to dilute the solutes on the left so that the overall concentration is the same. This is what starts happening to the cells in our bodies if the level of solutes in the tissue fluid or blood around them isn't the same as within the cell. Plant cells are also susceptible to this kind of water movement, and in fact they use this in order to open and close the stomata, by pumping salts into or out of the guard cells so that water will move by osmosis, causing those cells to become turgid or flaccid. For plants this isn't a big problem, because the cell wall is able to maintain the structural integrity of those cells even while water is moving, but animal cells obviously don't have a cell wall, so this is far more dangerous for them. If the tissue fluid or blood that's surrounding some cells contains too much water compared to the amount of solutes that are dissolved in it, then the excess water will move into those cells by osmosis, which may cause them to burst in a process called hemolysis. If the tissue fluid or blood contains too little water, we say it's hypertonic and the cells will shrivel up or undergo crenation. In order for consistent water levels to be maintained, the body needs to be taking in and releasing the same amount of water each day. We take water in from our food and drink and we lose it in three main ways. Exhaling it from our lungs as a waste product of respiration, sweating from our skin and finally by excreting it from the kidneys, which is also important because as we lose that water, this allows us to remove a waste product called urea, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. You can't control the amount of water that you're losing by breathing it out or by sweating, and you should know that you're sweating a little bit all the time, even when you don't feel warm. That means it's down to your kidneys to respond to you being overly hydrated or dehydrated by altering the amount of water and also salt ions that are lost through your urine. And this process is called osmoregulation. Pretty much every five minutes, all of the blood in your body passes through your kidneys, allowing 180 litres of blood to be filtered each day. As a result of this, you pass just under two litres of urine. You should be able to describe the role of sweating as part of thermoregulation, controlling the body's temperature. Sweat glands release sweat, which is mainly water, onto the surface of the skin. This is able to absorb energy from the skin and evaporate, and in doing so it cools the body down. It's important that you understand that you're sweating a tiny bit at all times, so as you get warmer you need to say that the body sweats more to cool you down more. Water balance is a nice opportunity to throw in some fairly easy maths early on in the exam. So for instance, you might get a question like this, where they tell you about all the different ways that water has been lost from the body over the course of a day, and then some of the ways that it's been taken in, and they ask you how much would this person have to have drunk in order to maintain their water balance. So in order for water balance to be maintained, we need to be taking in and losing the same amount of water. So firstly, I'd need to add up all of the water that they'd lost, 
and in this instance that's 2100 mil and so for water to be balanced they need to have taken in the same amount and I can see that they've taken in 500 mil from food but also the rest has come from drinking so I take that 2100 mil that they've lost and I take away the 500 mil from the food and that gives me an answer of them having drunk 1600 mil of liquid during the day linked to this, you could be asked how you would expect the amount of water lost by urination to vary on a hot day. Now this has come up in the exams recently and lots of people lost the mark because they were actually thinking with their common sense rather than their biology head on and they said well if it's a hot day you're going to drink loads and therefore you're going to pee loads. And to be honest I have a lot of sympathy with them because they're kind of right but in terms of biologically what's going to happen in your body the first thing is that if it's hotter you're going to sweat more. And remember you're talking about sweating more not just sweating because they do expect you to know that you are sweating a little bit at all times. So you're sweating more but also you need to maintain that water balance and so in order to maintain that water balance if you're sweating more you're going to urinate less. If you're sitting the higher tier then you also need to be able to describe the role of urination in removing nitrogen waste from the body. As we digest proteins, protease enzymes break them down into amino acids and these can't be stored in the body, so they need to be excreted safely. In the liver, the amino acids are deaminated, which means they have an amine group removed from them, and this forms toxic ammonia. This is pretty much immediately converted to urea, which is a little bit safer, although still fairly nasty. And then this is filtered out of the blood by the kidneys. Water is added to the urea and this makes urine, which moves through the ureter to the bladder where it can then be urinated out. Let's take a closer look now at what's actually going on in the kidney. The kidneys are supplied by blood by renal capillaries, and renal just means anything to do with the kidneys, in the same way that pulmonary means anything to do with the lungs, or hepatic means anything to do with the liver. So this blood is just the same as the blood in the rest of your body, it contains a mixture of water and glucose and salts and urea, and also much much larger molecules like enzymes and hormones which are both made out of proteins, and of course all your red and white blood cells. Now at this stage, under high pressure, that blood is going to be forced through a partially permeable membrane. And so this means that small molecules like water and ions like sodium and chloride ions can pass through that partially permeable membrane into a region of the kidney called the nephron. But the proteins are far, far too large to pass through that membrane. And so they, along with the red and white blood cells, and also some of the water, because it's not all going to go through that membrane, just continue on into the renal vein. Now at this point we want to scavenge some of what's been filtered out because obviously we don't want to be urinating out all of the water that's been filtered out and we want some of those salts and we particularly want to get back that glucose because that's a really valuable energy store. But of course the urea is a waste product and we're trying to get rid of it. So. Depending on how hydrated or dehydrated you are that day and also what your levels of various different salt ions are looking like, your body will absorb back some of the water and some of the salt ions but also as much of the glucose as physically possible because that's far too valuable a resource to waste. Um, and also we're going to leave the urea behind. So if you look at the nephron you'll see that the levels of water and salt ions go down a little bit as some of that is reabsorbed and all of the glucose is taken back into the blood but the urea is left behind. Now because we're only taking some things and not others we call this process selective reabsorption and the urea that's left behind together with the water and the salt ions is then going to pass through the ureter to the bladder so it can be urinated out. Time for a progress check. Pause the video and make sure that you can write down five bullet points that describe how a healthy kidney produces urine. The first step is that the kidney will filter the blood under high pressure. Then we're going to have selective reabsorption of whatever ions the body needs, however much water the body needs and all of the glucose. And then finally the urea, the excess ions and the water are going to be excreted in the form of urine. If you're taking the higher tier of GCSE biology then you also need to be able to talk about the role of the pituitary gland and antidiuretic hormone in controlling water levels within the body. The pituitary gland sits in the brain just behind the bridge of the nose and it's sometimes called the master gland because it produces a number of hormones that have downstream effects on other glands and produce other hormones. One of the hormones that's released by the pituitary gland is antidiuretic hormone or ADH. A diuretic is a substance that makes you urinate more, so antidiuretic hormone stops you from urinating. 
ADH is produced by the hypothalamus and it's released from the pituitary gland when the blood becomes too concentrated because there isn't enough water in it. When this happens, it increases the permeability of the kidney tubules. This means more stuff can pass through them, specifically water. And this means that at the reabsorption stage, more water is reabsorbed. If we look back at our picture of what's going on in the kidney, we can see that some water is reabsorbed, but when ADH is released, this is going to increase the permeability or the holiness, for want of a better word, of that second membrane, and therefore more water is going to be um, reabsorbed. This is controlled by negative feedback. So what this means is that ADH will be released and the permeability of the membrane will increase. So there will be more water pulled back into the blood. And when the concentration of the blood reaches a point where ADH is no longer necessary, then the pituitary gland will stop releasing it. Some people may experience kidney failure because they have chronically high blood pressure, high blood sugar, for instance, if they're diabetic, but it hasn't been diagnosed or effectively treated, because they have a blocked urinary tract, because they have an infection, or just because of trauma, like being in a car accident. People suffering from kidney failure may die as toxic waste substances will begin to accumulate in their blood, but they can be treated either by using a dialysis machine or by having a healthy kidney transplanted from a donor. Dialysis can be used to remove urea from the blood and also to restore the concentrations of other substances to normal levels, but it has to be carried out at regular intervals. So people receiving dialysis may need to go to the hospital multiple times per week for hours at a time. When the person is having dialysis, their blood flows through partially permeable membranes alongside something called dialysis fluid. Because there isn't any urea in the dialysis fluid, the urea will move through the partially permeable membrane by diffusion therefore moving out of the person's blood. The dialysis fluid contains quite high levels of glucose and also salts, and this will prevent those materials from moving by diffusion. It doesn't matter that there's no protein in the dialysis fluid because the proteins like hormones and enzymes are too large to pass through the partially permeable membrane, and so they will all stay in the blood. You could be given a table of data like this one and asked to describe and explain why it is that there are differences in the concentration of different substances in the blood plasma and in the dialysis fluid. Here we can see that the levels of sodium ions and glucose are about the same in the blood and in the dialysis fluid because we don't want those substances moving. If anything, the level of glucose is going to be slightly higher in the dialysis fluid because this means if there is any net movement, it will be moving into the person and giving them extra energy rather than moving out and causing them to be even more exhausted. The dialysis fluid doesn't contain any urea because we're trying to move the urea out of the blood as quickly as possible, and so we want to maximise the diffusion gradient. It's not necessary to have any protein in the dialysis fluid to stop the protein from moving because things like hormones and enzymes are much, much larger and therefore they're unable to pass through the partially permeable membrane anyway. Dialysis needs doing multiple times a week. It's very time consuming and it's not particularly fun for the person involved. And some people even lose considerable body mass every time that they have it done. One alternative is for the person to have a kidney transplant, in which they have their failed kidney replaced by a healthy one from a donor. And this could either come from a live donation from someone who's chosen to give up one of their two kidneys, or it could come from someone who'd agreed to be an organ donor who's since died because of something like a car accident, which means there hasn't been any impact on their ability of their kidneys to work. The advantage of having a transplant is that once that kidney is inside of you, it's able to work around the clock, so you're no longer having to go back to the hospital multiple times a week for dialysis. During a kidney transplant, a surgeon will connect the new kidney near to the bladder. The old kidneys are left in their original place. Besides the risks associated with surgery, the other major issue facing transplant patients is the risk of rejection. Each one of your cells contains tiny protein bumps called antigens, and these act kind of like a fingerprint, telling your immune system, this is me, this is my body. But if you received a donation from pretty much anyone else apart from your own identical twin, their cells will have slightly different antigens, and so your immune system may recognise this as being a potential pathogen and attack it. In response to the foreign cells, your white blood cells make antibodies which attack the antigens. To help avoid this, before receiving a donation, people undergo a process called tissue typing or tissue matching. And this is where we look for a donor who has antigens as similar as possible to the patients as we can. This is why often the most successful donations are those that are given by close relatives. 
Even where tissue typing is successful, patients may need to take certain drugs called immunosuppressant drugs, which suppress the immune system and prevent it from attacking the new organ. But this means that the patient is far more at risk of other diseases because their immune system isn't working as efficiently as it usually would be. Pause the video and write down three bullet points that explain why a transplanted kidney may be rejected. The transplanted kidney has different antigens to the antigens of the patient receiving it. This is detected by that person's white blood cells which make antibodies. And finally, the antibodies attack the antigens. This topic provides the exam board with a great opportunity to ask you to evaluate. And remember, anywhere in AQA GCC Science that you meet the word evaluate, you're going to be given marks for comparing and for writing a conclusion. So it's really important that before you finish your answer, you come down on one side of the fence and say which one is better. In this question, we're asked to evaluate the use of dialysis and transplants for treating somebody with long-term kidney disease. The first thing I do with any question that asks me to compare is to split my page in two because this is going to make it really easy for my examiner to see that I've covered both sides of the story. Remember, while you do get credit for arranging your ideas in a logical order, you don't need to be writing an essay. Your examiners love tables and bullet points because it just makes their life easier. To start with, I probably want to provide a bit of information to show that I know what these two techniques are. So in dialysis, we're talking about using a machine with a partially permeable membrane to filter the blood. Whereas with a transplant, a person is undergoing surgery to implant a new organ that's been tissue typed to match the patient. Now I want to think about some advantages and disadvantages of each method. Dialysis, as we've said, is really time consuming. I'm going to need to go to the hospital multiple times a week and that could have an impact on my employment prospects or just my general quality of life. On the other hand, if I have a transplant, then once that organ is inside me, it's going to be working all the time. And although I'm going to have to go back to the hospital for regular checkups, it's not going to be nearly as frequent as visiting the hospital for dialysis. On the other hand, there are a whole range of disadvantages. For one thing, I need a suitable donor. If I'm lucky, there may be someone in my close family who is a tissue match and who's willing to give me one of their two kidneys. But more likely, I may have to wait for somebody who's chosen to be an organ donor to maybe die in a road traffic accident, and that can be a really long waiting time. Once I have that organ, I'm going to need to take immunosuppressant drugs to stop my body from rejecting it, but that's going to make me more susceptible to other diseases. Also, in order to get the kidney inside me, I need to undergo surgery. And although this has become much safer over recent years, there are still associated risks with going under general anaesthetic and the risk of infection and all sorts of things like that. Even after all of this, it's possible that my body may reject the organ or just that it may stop working after some time, particularly if whatever made my kidneys fail in the first place is still an issue. For instance, if I have untreated high blood pressure or if I have untreated high blood sugar. With dialysis, there aren't a whole bunch of other disadvantages, but I may lose some weight every time that it's done because of the amount of sugar and water that I'm losing. Finally, we may want to think about what it is that's causing someone to be unwell in the first place and how likely this is to clear up. If somebody has a relatively short-term infection and it's knocked out their kidneys for now, but in a couple of months they're likely to recover, then it's much more likely that we'll want to use dialysis because there's no point in wasting a new viable kidney on somebody whose kidneys are going to be right as rain in a couple of months. Similarly to this, if the person has an ongoing condition which can't be treated, like an infection or high blood pressure or high blood sugar, then it would be a bad idea to give them um, a new kidney because it's just going to affect the new kidney the same way that it affected the older kidney. So as with all these questions, we could really argue the case for either side of this, either saying dialysis is better or a transplant is better, but it's really important that to get my final mark of this question that I do write a conclusion. So in this instance, I'm going to say that since we haven't specified the cause of the kidney disease, the dialysis is a better option because it's going to avoid the need for risky surgery and the immunosuppressant drugs when it's possible that the patient's illness may cause that new kidney to fail as well. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found that a useful summary of everything to do with water and nitrogen balance in the human body. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe below for more GCSE biology videos coming soon. And if there are other topics you'd like to see covered, don't forget to tell me in the comments.